Back to some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to this episode of We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. My volume is not up enough. You're listening to We Are Libertarians, as you've probably heard a hundred times you see on the screen. But I'll repeat it because you need to know We Are Libertarians. We Are Libertarians. It's brand recognition is what we're doing here. We're going to be talking about the Dave Chappelle special. We're going to talk about identity politics, straight pride. We're going to talk about Harry and the strange guy that's in my living room. Uh, so uh, stay tuned. It's going to be quite the show once we return. Warning. This show is for adults, produced by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Ah, I don't know what I said. Ah. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. All right, everybody. Welcome to the program. My name is Chris Spangle, and uh, you're listening to episode 366 of We Are Libertarians, recorded on September 3rd, 2019, here in beautiful Indianapolis, Indiana. And uh, I am... Let me just let me just turn this warning. Off. Ah! This show. Okay. Uh, <laughs> not everything's going to plan uh, tonight. Uh, that is Harry Price that you heard laughing at my misery. He is over the air. Uh, he is in his basement. He had to feed Gunther and uh, still refuses to come in. Says it's too cold. Even though what, what's that temperature say over there? Let me see. Seventy one. Seventy one degrees in here, and Harry still refuses to come uh, to come down and and uh, join me in the studio. I don't know how much more how much more warm do I have to keep it for you. I want it at least 72. At the lowest, it needs to hit at 72. I'm holding out for that one degree. Okay. Well, you keep dreaming, son. Yep. Uh, also here is a complete stranger to me. As you know, if you're a listener of the program and you come to Indianapolis, then you usually end up getting on because you're like, hey, I'm going to be in Indianapolis. I'm like, all right, come on by. <laughs> and uh, no exception to that rule is. True story. I messaged him and said, hey, I'm up here on business. I was wondering, do you, want to, do you want to grab a beer? Come on by. Yeah, his name is Travis McCurry. You are what? You're from what? South Carolina? South Carolina. I'll so you South fled Carolina. the hurricane. Is that what you've done? Uh, dodged. Dodged. Okay. So are you, uh, is your home in any danger of being hit by a hurricane? No. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, Travis, you hold what position with the Libertarian Party? Uh, I used to, I, not anymore. I used to be a vice chair, the vice chair for the South Carolina Libertarian Party. Libertarian Party. I apologize. That's okay. Um, and uh, a couple of years back, I stepped back, uh, had some personal responsibilities I had to take care of. Um, so I'm not as active anymore. Uh, still volunteer whenever I can. But as far as the position of being held, like a responsibility, um, having two kids kind of. Yeah, that'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. Travis, <laughs> Travis messaged me and he's like, hey, you, uh, I'm in town. You want to hang out tonight? I'm like, well, I got a show. You want to come on by? He's like, um, I slur my words. Uh, do you still want me on? I'm like, well, how bad is it? Uh, that'll determine the, the answer. I've got Harry. He mumbles. Uh, so, but uh, you, you're talking good enough. So, so yes, uh, Travis just came by to hang out. He ordered some Donato's pizza. I just made a delicious HelloFresh meal. Uh, the, the problem with those, have either of you done like HelloFresh or Blue Apron or any of those meals? I've done Blue, Day, Blue Apron before. Yeah, I love them. They're really good. I've loved Blue Apron, and I love HelloFresh, but I stack up on meals. Uh, so I have like 10 in the in the refrigerator. Now, so. I'll be honest with you. I did the trial and just stopped. Ah, you're a cheat. That's what you are. So, I like, it's cool, but I didn't use it that much. And where I'm from, I don't know if it's just a, more of a common thing or not, but I have a lot of, you know, deer meat. Right. Stuff mm -hmm. like that that I like to cook. So Did you bring some? Yeah. No, it, the TSA wouldn't allow me. Sorry. Uh, well, Travis, can you be a deer and uh, gather up the coasters oh, yeah. there for me? I think there's four of them. Ha hand me those there two. Um, now, Harry, what you're now you are aware, Harry, of what national 
really intergalactic holiday is taking place on Monday coming up, right? Hold on, let me check. Let's see. Um, yes, let's just all sit here while you. This is like worse than when somebody well, goes. Let me show you this video. While we wait on that, I'd like to make a shout out if that's okay. This better be good. My beautiful and lovely wife. Today is her birthday. Okay. All right, Tiffany. Happy birthday, sweetheart. I love you. All right, we'll do we'll do that for the bros. Yeah, that was a good hint, Harry. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <you're- laughs> uh, I think I've got it. I think I've got it. Uh huh. That is when. The Empress Elizabeth of Austria was assassinated by Luigi Machen. <laughs> I just turned it off. <laughs> yeah. No, it is, it is my birthday. And the best gift that I get every year, uh, the gift that Travis got his wife is leaving town. Uh, <laughs> so he could come on a podcast and eat. <laughs> He's literally eating Donato's. But I told him it was okay. But I said, listen, I'm going to make fun of you. Know that it's out of love. Uh, But the best gift that I get every year is from one of our listeners, Joshua Sexton. He is so nice. Last year, he sent these beautiful glasses with uh, catchphrases from We Are Libertarians on them. This year, he sent slate coasters. Uh, They are beautiful. One says, world's okayest broadcaster. You can see these on my Instagram or on our YouTube channel on this episode. We're we're recording this. World's okayest broadcaster, which I'm partial to, is my favorite. Uh, a wholly owned subsidiary of Christy Avery, which uh, is Christy Avery's favorite. That one made me laugh the hardest. Uh, I am not owned by Christy Avery, just greatly influenced by Christy, as I am all of our patrons. Um, but that one was pretty funny. Uh, so he says. Canadian. Ooh, I almost dropped this on my laptop. Canadian Goose Exterminator. Uh, which was uh, pretty funny. Um, That's by far my favorite one. Yeah, you'll notice the slingshot over there. Every time somebody <laughs> comes, everybody, sometimes that, that listens to the show or follows me or whatever comes by, they always go, That's real. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, it is real. I really do shoot uh, geese. They're coming back around, so we're, we're dealing with them. And then I think second favorite is 66 degrees. Deal with it, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. Um, so very thoughtful gift. And I just want to thank Joshua Sexton for that, for properly appreciating my birthday as no one else in my family or friendship circles, uh, do this random stranger on the internet that I've never met loves me more than, uh, all the rest of you. And it's frankly, it's sad, but I'll live. It's okay. Uh, uh, I do want to thank our patrons. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you those, those that donate at the $100 level. These are the people that I am completely, I have been bought and sold. They own me. Uh, it's modern day indentured servitude. They had your soul. To Christy Avery, as we mentioned, Craig DaCosta, um, Jason Doolittle, Jeff Bennett, brand new uh, $100 a month uh, patron, and Ed Brehob. Thank you guys so much for uh, being our $100 a month patrons and to all of you who uh, – listen, the bills have gotten a little more expensive lately, and we've had a few big donors drop off because they just – they had uh, other obligations, and that's always understandable. Um, we don't take that personal here. Um, but if you are impacted by the show, if you enjoy the show, if you think that we do good in the world, then please become a patron anywhere from $1 to $100 a month. Uh, and if you just want to give a one time, then you can go to wearelibertarians.com slash support and you can make a one time donation or once a week or once a quarter. Well, there's all kinds of flexible options, uh, but that all helps pay the bills here. The, the various hosting, you know, we have a, a variety of shows on the network and I've estimated that each one of those shows like Boss Hog or Brian Nichols or Ginger Archie with Trisha Stewart, those cost about $50 a piece. Uh, to have on the network per month. Uh, so, you know, we don't charge those people to be on the network and to lend the social proof of the We Are Libertarians uh, ship to those folks. We we just say, hey, we'll carry the bills because we've got a big Patreon. You do good work. And so we, we subsidize their work. So I'll be honest with you. Yeah. It's been a while since I've checked. Uh-huh. Uh, do you accept Bitcoin? Uh, yes, we do accept Bitcoin. So, yes, you can pay via Bitcoin so, uh, or donate or whatever you'd like to call it. So, um, so thank you to everyone who is a patron because you really do pay the bills. So I wanted to, to do that early. Uh, Harry, uh, I feel like I have – I legitimately haven't seen you in how long? 
It's been about two months since we started these contract negotiations, which is the real reason I haven't been down there. Yes. Uh, things are not going well. I refuse to budge on the 66 degrees. Last year, you got the comfy chair. Now, uh, Travis mans that particular position. Um, I don't know. It's not looking good, to be quite honest. Really just... I can't do this weekly. <laughs> Come on now. No, no, no. I wouldn't let you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, see in my head I'm like uh, he might think I'm serious I I tried to be mean to Newbie it's okay I'm kidding with you I can take it no we're back all right good more and more headed your way just uh, degrees with the temperature. I'm really thinking about you know maybe we're just retiring you know this way I could be with you know my family and kids well you can't retire because I have no one left (laughs) (laughs) you're all you're all that's left uh, Harry, you've been on uh, at least 100 episodes at this point, um, co-hosting every week with me. So we, we love having you when you can be here. We uh, uh, understand when you have to be on the Zoom. Uh, I said that like an old man. My boomerism is starting to creep in. The other night I had a dream that I was at Home Depot. I was shopping for tennis shoes. I found a sweet pair of Air Monarchs, which are the Nike dad shoes. This was a dream? This was a dream that I had. I woke up and I woke up right after the end of the dream where I was on my way to check out the shoes, to to, to pay for the shoes, and I saw a bag of hickory uh, Kingsford charcoal. I picked it up and I held it and gave it a hug and whispered, we're going to make so many great memories. (laughs) My early onset boomerism is becoming really concerning to me, Harry. It just just because it creeps up on you and you gotta like you gotta fight it and you gotta wonder why like why did i think about that you know every yeah. day i go in my back my backyard and go like hmm, i should build a deck whoa no no <laughs> run back inside the how house. old are you <laughs> well, I'm getting, i'll be 35 in april so yeah okay so you're you're younger i'll be 36 on monday uh my birthday was the correct answer to the national holiday on september 9th um but uh, how old are you Travis? Uh, 30, I'm turning 31 on September 15th. Okay. Do either of you have a thing that you do where you're just like, mine, oddly enough, is becoming technology? Because I've always been an early adopter. I've always used technology. And I think it's because I, like, I'm just rejecting that first. Where I, I, I remember distinctly a year and a half ago, we had a 21-year-old working with us at work. And I think that we re- reject. I well, I you know I work. I'm not IT like you two, but I do a lot of IT work. And I've noticed that I start getting angry at remotes. I start getting angry at apps that don't work. Uh, and we had a kid at work last year, and I go, I, I couldn't figure this thing out. I go, damn it, Bailey, fix this. And Bailey did it in like two seconds. I was like, oh no, it's happening. I, I feel like the once you get into your 30s, you start slipping into boomerism a little bit. Is there anything that you two have experienced where you're just like, this is not good. It's beginning. The only thing that I can recall about that or similar to that is getting up from a chair uh huh, or getting up from the ground where I was sitting down or playing with my kid. Yeah. And I basically... You make the noise. I make the noise. Like, uh, yeah, we all make the my, noise, right? And, and my joints start popping. Right. <laughs> it, uh, it's like, that's never happened before. Not on, it's like, so it's happened before, it's not every single time now. Yeah. It's like, okay, that's not good. Yeah, I've been going to Orange Theory because I'm trying to get myself in better shape. And uh, I went today and I went back to work. I went at lunchtime. I went back at work. I sat there for two or three hours. I got up to go get water. And I made the noise. Uh, uh, uh. Are you, are you, are you, you're very supple. Your joints are very loose, aren't they, Harry? You go to yoga, so you probably don't make the noise yet, do you? Oh, I, uh, uh, I make the noise, and that's why I go to yoga, to, to stop it. It puts, right. it, puts it at bay. You know? Yoda is effective. Oh, no, Yoda. Uh, yoga is effective at that. Wow, you nerd. I know, right? <laughs> the... One thing that I started noticing is that I care about creature comforts in, in cars. Yes. You know, like I was putting the, uh, I put coilovers on the RX-8. 
I've done this to cars for years. It's like, whatever, stiff stuff suspension, I don't care. I got it like, oh, man, oh, this is awful. I need a smoother ride. <laughs> Felt bad. And then I just like, you know, so I went out with the wrench and softened up the suspension. It was like, oh, man. I used to be able to just drive on basically a steel rod in a, in a spring. And once you get kind of some money and you can have some creature comforts like if uh, harry you would you've known your lovely bride for a long time but when you date younger women they're a little more like ah this is they have they're they're less apt they don't get why you like creature comforts Mm -hmm. no 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 that's where my remote goes you don't move that that's that's for my remote well this doesn't look nice no 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 this is where my remote goes (laughs) i don't know how sarah uh, Potter, per string Potter did it with Jeremiah because Jeremiah, the boss hawk of liberty, is the biggest millennial boomer I've ever met. And that guy lived alone for his entire life, basically, and had everything kind of where he wanted it. So I can't imagine the adjustment that, that uh, they went through. But yeah, you're like, this doesn't look nice. Like, no, that's where my stuff goes. Don't touch that. I like this is where it's been for five years. Leave it alone. <laughs> No, yeah. no, that's how you know you're a boomer when you when you pick your Brooks shoes because not because they look good but because they're comfortable and supportive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then when you you really know is when you go out with like the younger coworkers, and they'll like you know they'll just spend money on goofy things and you'll right. buy something that's like that's expensive but it's good quality. Right, so have it for a while. It's like, what? It's like, I'm going to buy this thing that's good quality, and I'll never have to buy it again. You bought that cheap thing, and it's going to break on you. Oh, I feel so old. Now that I think there's another generation that is adults, meaning the Zoomers, Gen Z, Yeah. I find myself being annoyed by that. I, I, you know, I couldn't be annoyed with my own generation, but now that there's a younger generation, I'm just like, you stupid little fucks. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> you are all dumb. I went to pick up Gunther up at daycare, and one of them was sitting there making the bye Felicia joke, and I just muttered about like that joke is older than you. <laughs> when did it happen? When did it happen where we started turning into these old men? I don't know. Was... The last two years, thirty is thirty four. The year is thirty four. The year when it happens to men, where they just start becoming John C. Dvorak. I've... Have you um, getting the jokes yet? Uh, I, I no, I, I have not because I follow meme culture, so I do get the jokes. It yeah. took me a minute to learn what eat meant, but I got <laughs> that. What I don't get is I watched a recap of the MTV Music Awards, mm-hmm. and I legitimately didn't know one single person that was on the MTV. Like I didn't recognize any of them. Like this band came into work the other day, Judah and the Lion. I had I had no idea they're this hot new band. They're huge, you know. So it's just like those sorts of things start happening around you where you just don't have any idea that they're popular. To like I don't know, it's just a band. But uh, so music for me, movie stars. Like I've started over the last like couple of years. I just kind of gave myself permission to stop following any of that. And now after two or three years, I don't know. Like I couldn't pick Blake Lively, and she's probably already over by now couldn't pick her out of a lineup if i wanted to yeah you know like billy eilish i've never heard a second of her music but i've started to hear that name but that's a person that like hit people probably were listening to her three years ago but and once it's made it made its way to chris spangle yeah. it's passe i've seen a youtube video about artists that i've never heard of before right not not their song not their video yeah like it's special about them because they're something right like the whole never meme, heard of them before. Like the whole meme set where it's nobody colon, you know. So I didn't get any of that. I was off the internet for a week, and I came back, and that's when that one generated. And I spent six months being completely confused by what it meant. So meme meme culture, you really have to keep up on. So uh, the big topic of conversation over this particular last man, I'd say week, two weeks, has been the Dave Chappelle special on Netflix called Sticks and Stones. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, Her- Harry, did you watch any of it? Yeah, I'm about, I want to say, 45 to 50% way through it because Gunther keeps wanting to watch it with me, and that can't happen. Yeah, uh, she'd go to preschool, and she'd start calling people <laughs> various names that you can say, but uh, Travis and I cannot. <laughs> um, what names are those? Hmm? 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 
you're my racism insurance. You uh, articulate them for me. Tra- we're going to play a couple <laughs> clips. You'll hear. Um, I, you, you, Travis, I know you watched it because I made you watch it before we started this show. Oh, I, I've already, I watched it twice at my house. Okay. And watched it through and through. Absolutely hilarious. Um, really love the special. Um, never really been a big Dave Chappelle fan before. Really? Um, mm. I've always liked it. I loved his memes. Um, he has the best memes. He, he, he what? <laughs> he has the best memes. On what? Social media? Yeah. I've got to follow Dave Chappelle. I had no idea he did he memes. Has, no, he does. He doesn't do memes. He's been memed. Oh, okay. All right. And I've used a lot of his in the past. But he's, he's always been fun. He's just never been really good. This one feels like he's been more honest. Okay. Just like more himself. And it just comes across as just like you're sitting next to somebody drinking a beer. Yeah. Making these, making these jokes. So I don't think that we're going to spoil anything for anybody because you've seen a lot of this stuff uh, out there. Um, let's play a couple clips for people just so they can kind of get the – the uh now, now i hadn't watched it yet here and harry you back me up on this if you agree chappelle was always countercultural. the chappelle show was uh always taking aim at power and power within society and this special was taking aim at the new power in culture which is cancel culture which is uh, really a left-leaning secular leftist culture Mm-hmm. And and he literally he literally it's like he took a notepad and he wrote down what offends people what are the most offensive com- topics of conversation in the world today and how can I make fun of them he started with LGBT people he talked about school shootings he talked about abortions he talked about everything and he did it at, you know child molestation and the Michael Jackson part. Um, he took aim at literally everybody in this, and it was really amazing to watch. Um, but that's the impression that I got. He, it's like he thought, all right, I can get away with it, so I'm going to give it a shot. I mean, do you agree with that, Harry? The Dave Chappelle show, in its origin, originality, did shoot at power. There was a lot of different power people in the like the black community that he would just start making jokes of. Like, right. no one made fun of... Uh, uh, you know, basically like a, a prince, you know, they just sort of like, I'm going to go after these people, you know? And then he brought on people that, you know, knew around and was, was okay with cracking jokes. People that people knew people from doing like stand up, but like most people in mainstream didn't never heard of these people. Right. And everyone knew of Charlie Murphy and had him, and watched him going around and do stuff, but really never like gave him like the limelight, like, no, come out here, you know, do some jokes. You're, you're hilarious. Most people just knew him as he was the funny writer. Right. I mean, is that kind of what you felt as well? Basically. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so let me play this clip um, uh, from Dave Chappelle's special. This is from the Facebook page, Netflix is a joke. Uh, they put it out there. They own all the rights to this. We are just uh, playing whatever they put out for free. I'm not going to play you. Uh, but I, I, Don't sue me is what I'm saying, Netflix. I'm trying to promote your special and telling people to watch it. So thank you. So in that spirit tonight, I thought I'd start my show a little differently. Tonight, I'm going to do something that I'm not particularly good at, but that I like to do. Tonight, I'm going to try some impressions out. I only got two. All right, the first impression is kind of dumb, but I like it. This, This is my impression. You ready? This is my impression of the founding fathers of America when the Constitution was being written. You ready? Here it goes. Hurry up and finish that Constitution, nigger. I'm trying to get some sleep. (laughs) It's not bad, right? All right, the next one The next one's a little harder. I want to see if you can guess who it is I'm doing an impression of. All right, let me get into character. You got to guess who it is, though. <clears throat> okay, here it goes. Uh, duh. Hey, duh. If you do anything wrong in your life, duh, and I find out about it, I'm going to try to take everything away from you. And I don't care what I find out. 
could be today, tomorrow, 15, 20 years from now, if I find out you're fucking good, finished. Who, who's that? That's you. That's what the audience sounds like to me. That's why I don't get coming out doing comedy all the time, because y'all niggas is the worst motherfuckers I've ever tried to entertain in my fucking life. <laughs> you can feel the honesty in that. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> it's so true. And I think why this is caught on in the way that it's caught on is that it's cathartic. It's, it's, there's this crazy right wing and crazy left wing and it just feels like the rest of us are caught in the middle and nobody can speak up because the two sides are so shrill and there are very few people who can kind of get away with doing exactly what he did but Dave Chappelle is one of the few people that can get away with it because it, let's be honest he's intersectional he's black so he can he's a minority and so he has the ability to say things that you and I obviously Travis can't say that Harry can say. Um, and I think he, because he's from Hollywood, he has a lot of famous friends. He's perceived to be liberal. And so it, it, I think it was brilliant for him to set it up and get the audience on his side with the founding father's impression, because you hear, uh, you even hear in that at one point when he goes, all right, so, uh, let me see if I can find it and we can try and catch the, uh, uh, Let's see. And what's really funny, he's actually commented on that as well during the during the special. He he mentions I don't work properly. He actually mentions that he can say something that somebody cannot, and then he gets something. Then he may brings up something that he isn't supposed to be able to say. Right. And then he says, "Screw it, I'm going to say it anyways." Right. Which is yeah. So so he lis- So he sets it up point. with the founding fathers, where he kind of goes. You know, he, he goes full left and these are just a bunch of racist founding fathers to try and get you into one frame of reference. Mm-hmm. And then the rest of the time, he just kind of takes aim at not just progressive, the, the left leaning side of the culture, but everybody, everybody got hit in this. But, you know, you can you can even hear in the end. Let's see. Listen for when he goes. So who do you think this is? And listen for the crowd as they yell Trump. Tomorrow, 15, 20 years from now, if I find out you're fucking good, finish. Who, who's that? Trump, Trump, Trump. So, you know, you, he put the audience in a certain frame of mind. I'll be honest with you. I didn't hear that before. Yeah. That is, that is really cool. Right. He's in Atlanta and he's, you know, so it's, it's uh, you just expect a comedian now. I work in the comedy industry. The com- comedy industry is so much different than it was five years ago, where, or 10 years ago, where 10 years ago it was a lot more people, people were more interested in the craft of stand up comedy. Mm-hmm. Now it's seen as a vehicle to get yourself a pilot. And so there are a lot of people who don't have the raw talent, they haven't put in the time, but they're young, they're usually white, they're usually guys, guys or girls who just kind of do stand up as a thing to do until they can get themselves on a reality TV show or their own pilot or on SNL or whatever. And so comedy, and they're all very liberal. And so this new crop of comedians is very liberal and they're not, they're very much steeped in, the, they're very much like journalists, the way that you think about journalists that write at the New York Times. And so he's taking aim even at his own industry by saying, here are the things that you tell me I can't joke about I'm going to do whatever I want to do because I'm rich and I can, and there's nothing you can do about it. So I think uh, it has been panned by every, uh, it has a 0% rating on Rotten Tomatoes because of bad reviews. Uh, Vice put out an article saying nobody should watch this. Um, I mean, it's just been panned by every corner of cancel culture, the people that kind of start that stuff. Um, But Harry, are you trying to jump in here? Yeah, I was just the uh, how can I put it? The the reason why like a lot of those liberals are sitting there, they're becoming comedians, they also like are they're rubbing some people the wrong way because they're coming at it differently. They're not hard in road warriors. So it's just like someone jumping into an industry right. that know nothing about it. It's 
we we have words for it, but we always told like, hey, you're not supposed to use that word anymore. People can be anything they say they want, and we back then we used to call those people posers. Right. Can't call that now. That, that's a great point. There are a lot of posers in the comedy community. For the record, um, there's actually been updates to that. It's now at 79%. 79% on Rotten Tomatoes? Yes, with an audience score of 90%. 90% of the audience liked it, 0% of the media, the no, media critics now it's liked. 79% of the media. Oh. Really? Okay. All right. So it, Now, the 0% article came from there's only like five reviews. Okay. So that was really early on. But Got it. That's, there was – at one point in time, that was the case. Yeah, yeah. like I the, saw the black critics took took you know came late in the. You know, oh, the, the ones that really wanted to nail them, got yeah, the article done fast and said, mm-hmm. "Right, there you go." Like Patch and Vice and some of these other sites. Yeah, yeah well, so, the black critics had to go to Popeyes, wait in line for chicken, they ran out, and they had to keep the house. Have you gotten a chicken sandwich? I I couldn't get one. I, no, they ran out. Uh, <laughs> did you did you try? Yes, the line was too long. Okay. At, at, specifically in the airport. Okay. All not right. The, not, not here, but the Atlanta airport. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, we, we couldn't get him here either. Yeah. Um, Chick-fil-A, I was in and out. I was in out. It was like, hmm. Went, just, even went back in line and got more waffle fries and a sweet tea. If memes can sell four months of chicken in one week, chicken sandwiches, imagine what they can do to the government, people. Um <laughs> So I, I want to I bring up a pattern that I kind of identified almost a year to the day. September 7th, I, I did an, ep, excuse me, an episode on the Chris Spangle Show, number 16. Uh, first, they banned Alex Jones. Joe Rogan will be next. And they've tried at various points over the last year. But I wrote out in the show notes the, the pattern of cancel culture. Uh, that's kind of become the, the term for it. And... So there's been a pattern of destruction of independent media figures and and various people that uh, across the board, some of them deserving, some of them not. But here is the pattern that I've identified. So it first starts with a millennial liberal blogger who posts a dishonest representation of a media personality. So you see somebody like Vice posting an article saying, don't watch the Dave Chappelle special. It's awful. He's transphobic. He's homophobic. Which hilariously, the biggest criticism that I saw of this special was the trans jokes. And the part where he talks about shooting a man in the face in his home, a drug addict in his home, that didn't raise any ire for people. But the, the trans jokes that were fairly innocuous um, were, were really what got people or making fun of the Michael Jackson victims, which I get. Um, but... Uh, it, the, the other subtle thing about the trans joke is when he made the Chinese face and noise, like you got to understand like, if you've studied Adam Carolla's career, he, you know, and the Asian community is very sensitive to certain things and very well organized. And so to, to invoke that, like that it was that was the moment when I went, Dave Chappelle knows exactly what he's doing. He's intentionally provoking cancel culture to come after him. And I think he knew he was immune to it for a couple reasons I'll identify. So a blogger will write on one of these click mill sites like Vice or Vox or whatever, uh, uh, basically a call to cancel a certain person for various offenses, for being a heretic, for not being down with the cause. Um, and, and trust me, it's a totalitarian impulse. And you look at uh, the, one of the Koch brothers, was it uh, David Koch who passed away? Not Charles, David. Uh, David Koch was a person that tried very hard to bring about prison reform and uh, inter- non-intervention across the overseas. He had a lot of policy positions that were very liberal, even back in the early 80s. And it didn't matter how much he gave the charity, how much he gave to causes that many liberals would agree with, because he wasn't completely sold out to the progressive ideology he was to be canceled. And uh, some of the most horrendous things were said about the guy uh, in the days after his death. I mean, it really, it's like Michael Malice said about uh, who's the actor from Sons of Anarchy who tweeted that he can't wait for Charles to meet his brother. Um, I forget, Ron Perlman. And he retweeted Ron Perlman's, you know, horrible tweet that Twitter actually took down and said, what if you're not the good guys? <laughs> like, what if you really are the bad guys? And that's what I think a lot of this, they don't realize is that 
this whole cancel culture stuff. It's like, what if you're harming society when you think you're helping? Um, so they write these kind of articles that, that get a lot of play. Other lib liberal bloggers tweet or reblog the piece echoing the falsehoods or the narrative trying to get something going. The worst part about that, and this is the most insidious part of it, in mm -hmm. my opinion, is they have articles, blog posts, newspaper pieces that are first certifiably false, yeah. that are provably false, and they get the tweets, gets the shares. It's proven false later. Mm -hmm. It is then corrected. But by that point in time, everyone has already read it. Right. They already know it, and they already believe it. And that becomes talking points for years to come. Or, or somebody, right. you know, like what happened with Ben Shapiro when he spoke at some uh, pro-life rally earlier this year. They, the, the guy purposely misedited exactly what he said, and then it just gets amplified. And people just amplify exactly whatever this, this blue check mark put out. And the smear just propagates. And so next, Media Matters begins monitoring the personality. They take the past and future statements out of context. Restless Giant does this as well. Uh, they start trying to dig and dig and dig to take things out of context. If you look at Gavin McInnes and a lot of what he has said, if you, if you look at Gavin McInnes, like refute on his YouTube channel, some of what is the, the commonly brought up things that he said in his past, he goes, they edited out all of the context. Here's the context of what I was saying. And then he shows you the context. Out of context is the key part of this particular step at number three. Um, Number four, newspapers report on the personalities out of context statements under the guise of danger to democracy. Or... Can we go back to three real quick? I need to ask yeah. you a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. So when they edit things out of context, mm -hmm. do you think it's intentional? Just your yes, opinion. Absolutely. Intentional or um, they just don't know how to do the job right? No, no, no. Media Matters entire uh, – so Media Matters was founded by this guy who was a former – his name is David Brock. He was a former – if you go watch anything about the Clintons and uh, 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 he wrote a book, basically what, – what was the, the scandal? Um, basically a lot of this one particular scandal. I don't know if it was uh, uh, Paula Jones or what, but he wrote some book. I think it might have been Whitewater actually. He basically like – wrote the book about these particular things. He was a right-wing guy and then came to Jesus and became a left-leaning. He's just always been a scumbag, basically. Like, he basically wrote for fringe right-wing magazines pro spreading rumors and lies about the Clintons when he was on the right in the early 90s, late 80s. And then he becomes a liberal, and then he starts Media Matters, and he starts doing that to personalities on the right. So he... David Brock is absolutely one of the people like when we write the history of what happened to America's fall, David Brock is one of those people that will be central to that story. But here's an example. A. because he's intentionally trying to uh, get clicks but by stirring up narrative. as a whole. Do you think it's intentional? Yes, okay. absolutely. I absolutely think it. I think that there is group think. I think in the, in the case of a lot of these liberal bloggers, I think. They get the media matters. So, so back in the 1990s, both sides um, started basically talking points memos type, type things. Like uh, for the right, there was a meeting, I think, at Grover Norquist's office every Tuesday or Thursday. And like every major figure on the right that you've ever heard of in the 90s would go, you know, the speaker, Newt Gingrich would show up. You'd have Bill Crystal. You'd have all these people kind of coming to this meeting and they would share talking points, and this is kind of what they were going to talk about for the, the next day. The left did that as well. That's kind of where Talking Points Memo, the left-leaning blog site, got started. Uh, and so there has always been an intentional cooperation and organization amongst the left and right on what they were going to talk about. And Media Matters is one of those organizations that began to help provide fodder and material to people who have those sympathies to share bad information. So then accuracy in media starts from Brent Bozell, who does that to the left media. And so and they so it's all intentional. It's all politics is war by a more um, gentle and humane effort. It, it's but it's still war and divisive nonetheless. So media matters absolutely does what they do. 
because they want to end the careers of people that they see as enemies. And they are all about total victory. And there are definitely people on the right who have the same kind of mentality, you know, and they have somebody in the presidency right now on the right that has that same mentality. It's not about what shared common values do we have. It's about I'm going to kill you before you kill me. I would actually completely agree with that. Uh, and I would add the rights tactic is, while it's similar, mm -hmm. uh, is more of a more of a don't listen to this person. Right. So the left tries to silence you, prevent you from talking. Right. The right just convinces you not to listen to this, to this individual. Y yeah. Well, both sides it's, definitely do it's that. The same, it's same ending right. effect. But it's like you post a New York Times article, you get somebody who's mm -hmm. a Trump fan who goes, "Oh, the New York Times, right? Okay." And the garbage does, doesn't read it. Right. Even, doesn't even consider exactly it. Exactly right. Yeah. Whereas the left is like, we want this person to not have access to the public square ever again. So it is. And I remember going to CPAC in 2003, and and Andrew Breitbart was there at that time, and and you, the the talk of that CPAC amongst the students, anyways, was there's this this organization of left leaning like restless giant you go to their website or move on or if you go to media matters like there these are organizations that basically uh do all these tactics to boycott to silence and the right needs their own uh, uh organization to do the same now they finally have over 15 20 years gotten to that point mm -hmm. uh but they they were behind the game and they they've caught up, which is why you you see like this, the New York Times bitching about how, how dare right wing organizations connected to Donald Trump Jr. tweet out anti Semitic tweets from our reporters. This is an attack on the press. How about what you did to Kyle Kashov, the the Parkland student who's pro gun, where you guys basically got him kicked out of Harvard, right? So nobody feels sympathy for the New York Times because they do to people like Kyle Kashuv or however you say his name, mm -hmm. what the right is doing to them. And, and so it's like you either stop the game or the game is going to be played on you and nobody's going to be happy. Uh, so that's kind of, th there, there's an intentional dirt digging game. It has always been this way. It will always be this way. Well, that's it's the same kind of story in World War One with the gas, must guess. Right. They all agreed, we're never going to use it. Right. We're not going to use it until one side does it. And then everybody has to use it. And then everyone has to use it. Right. Uh, it's a dirty, unhanded, underhanded trick. It's not a very good tactic for polite society. Right. But politics is not that. Harry, what were you saying? I was the one thing that Owen got me was how the media was up in arms about Khashoggi, the media, uh, the journalist Khashoggi, when he got chopped up in that Saudi right. Arabia. Yeah. And then silent about Andrew Duff. Oh, screw that guy. Let him get hit with cement. Right. But he's a journalist, too. Remember, I, there's other journalists, and it's like, oh, okay, I see how it is. Yeah. No, but he's not a real journalist because I get spammed by left leaning Twitter friends, quote unquote. Almost daily about how I retweeted Andy No once about the Portland Antifa crowd, and they couldn't believe I was amplifying this fake journalist. And then and they kept a, sending he's a, he's a propagandist. They kept he, right. They kept sending me things, and I go, okay. Since you're now into the into the business of qualifying journalists, the information is being provided to me by a blogger. What's the difference between your source on the left and Andy No, or however you say his name? So right. Well, is it's maddening because at the end of the day it's we know what you're doing you don't have any standards you just have standards for the other side which means you have no standards at all so so newspapers because the journalists at the new york times and time and newsweek and i don't know if those still exist but or the washington post they they basically just live on twitter and they think twitter is reality they start to see their uh, fellow graduates from columbia journalism school retweeting these these blog posts and these accusations and that's how cancel culture kind of kicks up and so they lend their credibility their social proof of their major media outlet to allegations or to uh, condemning certain people and then op-ed writers and cable news take the out of context statements the the uh, the social proof that was lent by uh, those particular journalists that write a story just questioning exactly uh, or, or, or like when they wrote in the New York Times a few uh, weeks ago with where, uh, where they wrote about a 
negative concern. It was a negative story about a conservative uh, guy who had gone down the rabbit hole on YouTube and had become almost become a white supremacist. He never actually went through with it, but now he's a Democrat. And so his soul was saved and it had nothing to do with anybody in the photos attached to the story, but they had a collage of Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson and Joe Rogan and the whole point is to basically, in with the social proof of the New York Times, to link these independent thinkers, these independent voices, to dangerous, shady things. Um, so they they write a story that makes it look legitimate, and then the op-ed writers and the cable news talking heads debate the morality of the out-of-context false statements. The debate spills over to social media and becomes totally detached from the original content. The repetition makes it true to the majority of people. So when, when it finally gets to you, it's so far from the, from the truth, you know, that the, the Dave Chappelle thing is different because you can sit down and watch it and you will watch it because it is a comedy special. But for most things that a podcaster may have said five years ago or something that uh, Tucker Carlson said, for instance, you probably never will go watch the Tucker Carlson clip. You will just hear what is said about the Tucker Carlson clip from the amplification on your social media or in the media outlets and the talking heads debating white Tucker Carl white uh, Tuck white white supremacist Tucker Carlson statements. Um, so, you know, in the case of Alex Jones, I personally have never seen video of anything that he said about Sandy Hook. Now, I, I'm not I'm not defending Alex Jones because I'm positive he said something about Sandy Hook and probably called it a conspiracy. I personally have no idea, but that has never stopped any of us from going, yeah, he said a lot of bad things about Sandy Hook. Well, maybe he did or maybe he didn't, but the idea that Alex Jones encouraged family uh, people to go harass the families of Sandy Hook is just a truth now because it has been repeated so often, first in the liberal blogosphere and on Twitter through amplification and then in newspapers as news articles – and then by op-ed and debating heads on one side or the other, um, that's just become true. But you and I, we can't say for certain if Alex Jones ever on his radio show said, go harass the families of Sandy Hook members. If he did, that's a terrible thing. He should never have done that. If there's video of it, don't you think we would have seen that by now? So I, I, th I think we have to question a lot of that stuff and go, what did Alex Jones say about Sandy Hook? I personally don't know. All I know is what Alex Jones says he said about Sandy Hook, which I take with a huge grain of salt um, because, A, it's Alex Jones, and, B, he is defending himself. But I don't necessarily trust that Vox got the story right either. Uh, so then journalists began asking public figures if it is appropriate to appear on the program using social proof to make it seem dangerous or wrong. So then it's guilt by association. So you get Susan Wojciak, or whatever her name is, uh, the head of the – of YouTube going on Recode Decode with Kara Swisher, who's the most anti-free speech person in the media today in the Silicon Valley. She's a tech journalist sitting there asking uh, the head of YouTube, why, why is Ben Shapiro on YouTube? I isn't that a gateway to white supremacism? Uh, now, Susan Wojciak is never going to challenge the fact that Ben Shapiro, the Orthodox Jew, has been the number one target of white supremacism for many, many, many years. Uh, it's just an accepted premise because Kara Swisher says it, and she's a journalist and lends social proof to it. So the CEOs of these social platforms go, um, well, you know, I have to denounce Ben Shapiro and anything that he might have said. They, they, this makes the company lawyers, shareholders, the vain CEOs panic over the bad press. And so they start to just kind of create this little narrative of things. So there, there's sort of always this little this storm brewing. And then when that particular person screws up, like Alex Jones did, for instance, and in saying, you know, grab your guns, get ready to the battlefield, they wait for the most convenient controversy to be created by this system to justify the removal of the figure. It's at this point the figure is so toxic they're abandoned by employers, sponsors, corporate, corporations, allies, friends that aren't willing to be subjected to the appearance of support for whatever fake hate speech or violence that the narrative pushes – the chilling effect causes members of the media's media figures echo chamber to start self-censoring. Now, the population has been so thoroughly propagandized that they don't protest the action, which encourages the censors to move to the next victim. 
And the system is then applied to an ever-increasing amount of figures that politically disagree with the network of liberal writers at clickbait mills like Mediate, HuffPo, Raw Story, and BuzzFeed. And uh, since I've written this, and since I kind of identified this in 2018, you've seen them go from Alex Jones to now more conservatives and more liber libertarians since this episode. Liberty Memes, for instance, was banned. So it, it is ever-increasing. And so... Once you get to Dave Chappelle, Dave Chappelle is just kind of watching all this, and he's watching people like Kevin Hart get kicked off the Oscars, and he's watching Roseanne lose her show, and he's watching people that he personally knows, like Louis C.K. going through this mill. Like in his special, he said, Louis C.K. didn't do anything you could call the police for. Now, I'm not going to defend what Louis C.K. did, which was asking to masturbate in front of women, and then they said – yes or they didn't say anything and he just went ahead and did it to completion like weird gross behavior uh and certainly not appropriate in any way shape or form and certainly a like it's a it's a male dominating it's an act showing domination it's certainly not good well i think that crossed the line on that one was the fact that they were co-workers or employees uh, it was fellow comedians. I mean, I know a couple of the comedians that were involved in that, and one of them, one of the comedians, she's just a terrible person. So weren't they on the like the set of something they were all working on together? Maybe. Uh, like they were like there was something actively going on, and they were taking a break or something like that. And that that may have been one of the instances. I know he did it in front of like Sarah Silverman said on Stern that he did it in front of her. Yeah. Um, but my point being is that Louis C.K., he knows – Dave Chappelle knows a lot of these people personally. Um, he was blamed for mainstreaming R. Kelly in the New York Times uh, by joking about R. Kelly, the I'm on piss on you, piss on you. Somehow that, that video on the Chappelle show is, is, white, is just whitewashing the sins of R. Kelly, and Dave Chappelle is to blame, according to the New York Times, for uh, allowing R. Kelly to continue his sins. Uh, so Dave Chappelle has been kind of a product of this. And so they've been picking and picking and picking at him. And I think he said, enough. And I'm going to, I'm going to dare you. Now, the reason that Dave Chappelle can get away with canceling cancel culture in a way that very few, if any other people can get away with it, are several reasons. First reason is he's an intersectional black man in America. He's a comedian. Uh, so he, he, there's the obvious clearance of he's just joking it's comedy lighten up which i know you've seen um and the fact that most millennials have spent 20 years watching the Chappelle show it's like south park the Chappelle show howard stern some of these uh these uh, man what are some others harry that that are just like major things that when we were in high school and college and in our 20s that we watched that were just like anti-power College humor, Opie Anthony. Yeah, like things like that. That just like Chappelle show for uh, The Office is one of those things that like Steve Carell could kill a man and everyone would be okay with it because we just have, <laughs> we love The Office so much. You know, like we have spent our entire adult lives watching Dave Chappelle and The Chappelle Show. We get that it's subversive humor, that it's raw, that it is intentionally inflammatory that it's going after power with humor it's satire in a way uh i think one of the greatest satirical pieces was the clayton bigsby bit <laughs> with the black klansman uh, i just think it's 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 use of irony just illustrates points in a way that were were fantastic and i think he was using irony and satire in a way in this special to illustrate to people who get offended all the time that you need to stop being offended. And I think if you're one of those people who watched this particular special and you were offended by it, you're the person he was targeting, not me. Yep. You're the person that he wanted to reach with this special. Basically saying, but did you die? Did you laugh? Can you, can you laugh at life's problems? Uh, I think that if you were offended by it, you're the exact person he was trying to offend with it. And uh, he was doing it to get you to think about your own offendedness which i personally don't think offended is an actual thing you can be shocked in the clinical or, or classic sense you can be horrified i don't know what feeling is offended harry <laughs> you have any idea what feeling is offended 
Like, if somebody says to me, I am offended, I say, you're a fucking liar. Hmm. I don't know. So, sometimes I believe I am unwrestleable. Uh, <laughs> I, can, I, I see things that are like, woof, man. I would probably uh, think of last week when, when um, after the passing of Jesse Combs, someone posted a meme about it. And I was like, all right, give me a week. I'll laugh at that. But right now, give me a while. Yeah. I need a bit, you know. That's because certain things require certain context. Right. And yeah. so if you don't have the particular – so – And the – I'll also say this one thing. The, the funny thing about the R. Kelly bit is – he went after everybody at that R. Kelly bit. He was talking about how black people won't really stick it to R. Kelly. That it's like, all right, yeah, I've seen the tapes. Yeah, he's, you know, I want to see her there getting peed on with two forms of government ID. You know, a cop verifying the ID. I was like, what? You know, but but it just it, they talked about it. But so did the Boondocks. They also made fun of, it, of black people like won't won't convict R. Kelly for any of that stuff. Yeah, so. The liberal blogosphere did what they always do, which was write articles about somebody who said something offensive about the alphabet people or Michael Jackson's victims or whatever, and it didn't work. They got mocked. He turned it around on them because, it, A, he's a comedian, and B, nobody amplified it. In fact, the opposite happened. Instead of Twitter and social media amplifying the outrage at Dave Chappelle for his insensitive comments, the outrage was returned back on Vice. Go look at the thread underneath the Vice tweet of just the, the rage at Vice for tweeting such a dumb article. It's literally like because it? he's so beloved in our generation and by the people who are on social media that he got away with it. He got away with he 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 neutralized it so it never really made it to the talking heads it never really made it to the mainstream news it never really made it to those upper steps where people and friends and coworkers and and uh past associates and sponsors and agencies were having to denounce Dave Chappelle for making a Chinese face while talking while mocking transvestite or trans trans people excuse me uh he he never it never got to that point because it never was amplified because he was the one person who could neutralize the the propellant yeah so social, set off his trap card right S social media is the lighter fluid in all this mm -hmm. the liberal blogosphere is the match and the news media is the charcoal but social media is the lighter fluid that really makes things spread you can throw a match on some charcoal and nothing really happens but once you hit it with that lighter fluid, and so because Dave Chappelle is so beloved by people in our generation, he was able to neutralize, he canceled cancel culture, I've seen some people say. Now, I don't think that's true. I think we're kind of going to always live with this mob, but I think it was a moment that caused everybody to kind of reset, and it kind of exposed the cancel culture crowd online and in these clickbait mills uh, as charlatans. And so maybe we'll do less of it because of Dave Chappelle's special where he intentionally tried to get them to cancel him. Right. And there's also like the timing of it. Um, also, you know, like it came out of the best time. And it, so it, cancel calls are basically got three massive blows dealt to it. You know, like this big body blow by D Dave Chappelle and some other stuff that came out of it with pro Jared and another body blow uh, because of uh, Zoe Quinn and um, what happened with Alec. What? All right. Bearing the lead. I'm go back. I'll go back. I'm going to swing around, uh, but uh, don't light your charcoal with charcoal uh, with lighter fluid. Go get a chimney, light it with paper. Don't put, you know, don't waste the fluid on there. I was Just, talking about a barbecue, but okay. Uh, but anyways, the, the body blow, like I said, the big ass body blow with uh, Dave Chappelle, like just rock cancel culture. But the other thing that also happened on cancel culture is, uh, I'm just going to paraphrase these two events because unless you're really into it, you don't even care about these people, but you never really saw this happening, was this uh, YouTuber, Pro Jared, which he has a host of his own issues, and he got apparently people trying to cancel him earlier in this year, 
and he's way quiet, and he is. This, is this the younger guy who, or that's Charles? Somebody Charles. Yeah, Charles. But like, Pro Jared is back, a little okay. angry, and he's talking about how he's got the receipts, and he's gonna like basically he's showing things up, and like, no, 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 what was said about me is false, and I've now I've waited to now come back at it for everybody, and. Which is it's also so it's weird so it's like that huge like then it's a, like a jab back jab right back at cancel culture that was weird was also one person I got into it was like Pamela Hort who misremembered something which did a great job of coming back on you know what Pro Jared is right I misremembered that moment I apologize I never should have spoke up about this and it was like an amazing moment then fast forward uh, then around the exact same time Zoe Quinn famous person who. Five guys from, from everyone knows are five guys from Gamergate, right? That's what everyone wants to bring up and talk about about Gamergate. But Zoe Quinn comes out and has and and they try to bring that and her ilk try to bring uh, basically a Me Too movement to the indie game devs and basically tries to cancel a indie de- an indie game dev. Well, not try does cancel an indie game dev and then gets a, gets his game canceled. He gets thrown out of the industry, basically blacklisted, right? And the guy eventually, in a darkened place, committed suicide. And now everyone's like, it's a total shock right now. They're like, well, okay, what just happened? Because, you know, this cancel culture basically finally have killed somebody. They've drove someone to suicide. Did you see the article in Reason Magazine about the reporter who it was part of Me Too, where basically the two accusations about him, he was a reporter... Um, uh, I'll find it and I'll put it in the show notes because it's a, it's oh. an absolutely stunning article. And then the lack of empathy from women in even our Facebook group for this guy was stunning to me. Where the, the, basically the first woman, it was a consensual sexual act. She just was unsure about it afterwards. Mm-hmm. It leaked out somehow and so it was a big problem. And then the second one where basically it was another mutual uh, instance of, of consensual sex and then she basically used it to make a name for herself in the Me Too movement. And that wasn't good enough for some women in our, in our fa- one woman in our Facebook group was like, well, he, it's just time for men to pay. And I went, that couldn't be further from libertarian values if you tried. Like, and that is really the problem with so much of this. It's illiberal values. And as classical liberals, we believe in the, in the dignity of every single human being. Racism, sexism, uh, of, of any variety, um, every person is, should be valued and is afforded dignity and respect. And when we start to move away from that, then we start to move towards society that is becoming much worse because we become more tribalistic as opposed to more individualistic. And... In that, this guy's career has basically been ruined because one woman basically sank him so she could make a name for herself in in a, a tribe of Me Too people. And he was just like this low-level L.A. Times reporter in China. And now he's living in his mom's basement. He's on a bunch of drugs. He's suicidal. Like, he's he can't get work. His whole life is ruined because he had two consensual sexual affairs like it just it's it's crazy to me because he had any kind of notoriety their word sank him i mean he he didn't seem to have done anything wrong it wasn't even like a gray area like with nc's and sorry where yeah that wasn't cool but like you know she sucked his dick and that's kind of a clear but at the same time he was aggressive like it wasn't even that like if you read the article you're just like this dude got fucked like hard yep. for no reason at all so And I think that's the problem is that a lot of this stuff is liberty. That guy's not alone. That guy's not alone. There's tons of these guys. I bet if we, and it's and it's sad to watch like like watch this whole generation of guys that had to suffer this. And that's what at least got to have to do the career. Yes, how many people of that suffer for some of that because of some Title IX stuff that got hit in kangaroo courts in college? Never got the got ever got out of their degrees. Never got the launch. Never will have that notoriety because they got something like that a lie like that happened to them. Right. Like that big movie that's coming out about the football player who got accused of rape and, you know, and now is, you know, you know, got exonerated and missed his entire shot of his football career. 
Yeah, so I, I want to talk a little bit more about, I don't want to go into false accusations, all that stuff, because I don't want to end up in straight pride territory. Oh, straight pride. <sighs> all right, what do you guys think about this straight pride parade? Seems kind of gay. Yeah, honestly, how many... <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and not the good kind, and not the good kind, because gay would be fun. If it was a gay pride parade, it'd probably be a lot of fun. It's not just... <laughs> uh, how many gay kisses do you think were at the straight pride parade? <laughs> All of them. All of them, that's <laughs> right. Uh, let's see here. Let's see if we can find pride. some can sort of it. article about this. Uh, uh, this is from CNN. I chose this over um, HuffPo, so you're welcome. A straight pride parade in downtown Boston attracted counter-protesters and a heavy police presence, resulting in almost three dozen arrests. A large number of counter-protests taunted marchers Saturday and chanted, Alt-right, get off our streets, no justice, no peace. Not really good rhymes, to be honest. They could do better. counter unprecedented <laughs> Nah, I am not giving free advertising to CNN. Shut your mouth. Uh, Counter-protesters outnumbered the parade participants. Boston's mayor also condemned the parade and encouraged residents to attend block parties and other events that celebrated the city. 34 people were arrested at the parade. Eh, this is kind of boring. I want the good stuff. Maybe we should go to HuffPost. Let's see what... Uh, 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 should we do BuzzFeed? The Straight Pride Parade is the newest far-right meme. Or the Boston Straight Pride Parade actually happened in people something uh, with HuffPo. Uh, BuzzFeed or HuffPo? Neither. Like, because that was like a freaking joke. All right, let's see. It all started out at. It'll be very similar no matter which one you pick. All right, let's. It's all, it's all going to be terrible and awful, and we're all going to end on a, li on a list anyways. I'm just looking for some details. All right, here, let's go to the Boston Globe. All right, maybe they'll do us right. Um, let's see here. The Boston Globe. Oh, man. Someone just reading the comics and someone said the Popeye's chicken sandwich wasn't good at all. I, I trust their taste buds. Uh, <laughs> is that Lex? No, no, no. No, go, go away. Uh, let's see here. I'm just, I just, I don't want to connect with Facebook. I just want to read your stupid fucking story. I don't, <laughs> I hate this. I hate it so much. See, that right there is why I was slow to respond to some Facebook mess messages uh -huh. because I don't have the app installed. Uh -huh. I don't stay signed in. The moment the browser goes away, Facebook goes away. Right. Isn't it great? Smart man. Um, so it was a mile-long procession uh, from Copley Square to City Hall Plaza. Shame on you, many protesters yelled, flanked by hundreds of police officers, passed block by block of security barricades. After the rally ended at 4 p.m., some of the protesters turned their anger towards the mayor and police, whom they assailed for allowing the parade and then protected the marchers. Assailed? Assailed, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, a phalanx of police riding motorcycles rolled up Congress. So basically, they were trying to protect these particular protesters. Um, let's see. I'm trying to get some more details. I don't care about the fights. Like, they're just talking about the fights. Uh the parade, which attracted some out-of-state marchers and included a Trump 2020 float, was organized by a group called Super Happy Fun America. Its leaders had said they are not bigoted in response to criticism that they are homophobic. But protesters called the parade an affront to the LGBT community and an intentional effort to stoke discrimination. This quote-unquote other side is pretending that they're just a foolish group of freedom of speech lovers who are advocating that straight people have all the rights that queer people have. Uh, who helped organize a protest called Hands Off Our Pride at City Hall Plaza. Um, well, here's the thing. So about 600 protesters outnumbered an estimated 200 marchers after the parade reached City Hall Plaza. So they do, the straight pride people do have a point in that the opposition is fairly anti-free speech, considering they just went to, like, just let them march. Mm-hmm. Who gives a fuck what any of these these guys? We know what they're saying. Like to me, it's very clear. I'm not. I'm not gonna sit here and go, well, why not just have a straight pride parade? What's wrong with that? Like, we know what they're doing. It's like when David Duke put on a suit. It's like we know that you just twitch the hood for the suit, and mm -hmm. you're trying to talk in America is uh, keep America America. 
Mm -hmm. We know what language you're using. You're just changing your language to be more palatable to more people. But at the end of the day, you're still David Duke. I mean, like, see, this would be a perfect example of a way of dealing with, you know, the straight pride parade. You can very easily say, look at what they're doing. These are the people you need to be aware of. But instead, they go to it and they try to scream it down. And then they become the story. Right. They turn basically questionably moral individuals into the victim. Right. And then they get to play the victim game. Yeah, and that's exactly what all sides in this one. They want the, our society is just completely filled with victimhood politics. Mm -hmm. And it is politicians taking advantage of people with with their anger. Um you know, this so they didn't interview anybody in this story that I can tell um that Milo Yiannopoulos was the the uh the Grand Marshal. Of course he would be. So they didn't interview anybody who was actually in the <laughs> thing. Uh, but th there's another one that is trying to form a straight pride uh, protest. I think this is a Modesto. And listen to what this guy says. Th listen to this Freudian slip. This is to justify attacks against us in that part. And when they come, you're going to turn right around and say, well, we've deserved it. We haven't done anything. We're a totally peaceful racist group. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. just, listen, just listen to that again. It's the greatest self owned. When they come, you're going to turn right around and say, Well, we deserved it. We haven't done anything. We're a totally peaceful racist group. <laughs> <laughs> if you want that clip, you're going to have to Instagram account, Nasty Feminism. Good luck. Um, so. But yeah, we know like the intention behind all this is not like it, it. And this is this is where I get why the concern over Dave Chappelle's special. Uh, he's a professional comedian, you know, you can kind of tell where his heart is. You get the, the context of this thing. It's why are you giving permission to people who t genuinely don't have the abilities you have to talk the way that you, you're giving permission to people to be racist or transphobic or what i get that point of view um but at the same time let them be racist let them be transphobic let them talk out loud so then you can know who you don't want to associate with like for me i base everything on my libertarian and christian principles which means that every single individual that i come across is deserving of dignity respect love uh, I am not the most warm person. Uh, Travis I, is a total stranger to me. He, I said probably five words to him. I said, sit down. We're going to watch Dave Chappelle. And then the next time I talked to him, we were, we were on the air. To be fair, you did give me water. I did give you water. So I did give a cup to the least of these. But uh, I'm, I'm not the most warm uh, person. I'm not great at building community like I used to be. I don't know what happened. I'm just not fun anymore. I'm, I become my parents. Uh, where I uh, enjoy work and not associating with other people. Um, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what your skin pigmentation or your political beliefs. Like there's this guy, his name is Wilson. And Wilson is a 70, near 80-year-old gay man, progressive, worked for the most liberal congresswoman. Uh, Wilson and I have become friends over the years uh, because he's a troll, I'm a troll, uh, he's super progressive. I'm libertarian, and we love to go back and snipe back and forth on each other. You know, he sends me cute little memes on holidays, and I say, "How are you doing?" and wish him a happy birthday. And like, there's a there's some level of friendship between me and Wilson. I have respect for Wilson, um, even though he shit posts me constantly. But I know when Wilson shit posts me, he he's laughing as he's doing it. He's not doing it to be an asshole. He's doing it because he thinks it's funny to pick at the little libertarian boy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I so I get that he's coming from a place of somewhat mutual respect. And so I don't mind when he does it to me because we have some level of relationship. I don't mind when people disagree with me because I don't need you to agree with me or my politics for us to be friends. I don't need you to be the same color or religion as me for us to be friends uh, or for us to just get along and work together. I do care about how you are as a person if you if you treat me poorly if you treat other people poorly if you're a narcissist that abuses others i have a real problem with you but at the end of the day we are picking all of these superfluous tribalistic things to separate and divide we're allowing ourselves to be divided 
And it's because uh, of identity politics on both sides. And so identity, I don't know, it's a guy named Eric Erickson in the 1950s who was a psychiatrist, I believe, or a sociologist who identified, he came up with the word identity, basically. It's not a word that has been around for more than 70 years. And so what identity basically does is it conveys basic information within a society to other people. And it is kind of a designation that it, it, between our inner self and society's recognition of our worth and dignity. And so that's really important. How you view yourself and how others view you, how close does that match up? So how Harry views himself as a strong black man with a multitude of interests and points of identity, um, you know, good employee, good father, good husband, keto, all these things that he really cares about. How do, do other people treat him with dignity and respect and with self-worth? Is he viewed as a, a person who is uh, treated well? Or is he treated as a person who is less than? And he's part of his, let's say, you know, you two are nerds. Uh, like nerds forever, their identity, if you identified as a nerd, it was something to be ashamed of. Reinhold says this all the time. He goes, and then somewhere along the last 20 years, it became cool to identify as a nerd. But it used to be a very painful thing to be identified as a nerd. And so w dignity comes from belonging, and we want others to recognize our self-worth. And self-esteem truly... Yes, you can work on your own self-esteem, but it does arise from how others view you. And so when a group like the LGBT community doesn't feel that they are getting the same level of dignity that straight people are, that's a problem. It is, in, it, it is humiliating and indignant to be in a hospital room and have your life partner of 30 years dying in the next room and you can't go in because you're not married. And even when it's a civil partnership, it's still society saying your bond isn't worth the same as a straight couple. That is indignity. And so that is fundamentally different than the centuries, millennials view, millennia view that, that sex between a man and a woman is the normal state of things. Okay, now I'm a traditionalist in, in some sense of the word. Uh, I do not participate in homosexual activities. I, I personally don't care if you do. I don't think that that is uh, anything that, like, I just typically view things as what is my own personal morality mm -hmm. and how you handle your business. If you ask me my opinion, I'll tell you my opinion, but I'm not going to judge you based on what you do. Let's say Travis came in here. He was flamboyantly gay. We get along famously. Mm -hmm because he's a human being that I can learn some things from. Harry, I have learned a tremendous amount of things from you because of your blackness. Uh, your, why did you make a face when I said that? So racist. <laughs> I didn't mean it to be racist. <laughs> it's true. I grew up in a very white town. I'm a very white person. And to have a friend who has different experiences with, than I do has taught me a lot. Uh, and You are very white. I'm finding out how white you are. Every week now. Every week, yes. The pat down has really brought out my whiteness. Um, but the idea that somehow straight people are being marginalized and persecuted and so they need a straight pride parade to make a statement is just fucking foolish and ridiculous and stupid. I mean, there's just no other way around it. You're just, you're you're being provocative and you're trying to be funny, but you're not funny and nobody really cares. And everybody that went can't like, it just, nobody cares. Like I, I just like, if you participated in the state straight pride, I, I just assume that you are a white identitarian, maybe not a white supremacist, but you are a person who cares so deeply about it, keeping your identity at, at the forefront of society that you don't care how you look, that you don't care what other people think of you, and you don't care about the, the position of other people who don't have as many um, uh, opportunities or, or have suffered indignities. Like every gay person has suffered indignities. And that doesn't mean that, like, 
I'm tr- trying to think where to go next because I, I, I'm trying to get those people who think that this. Can I is, challenge you on that? Yes, go ahead. So, to an extent, you're right. Uh, white people are not being marginalized and not being attacked and not, especially not by anything that would be institutional. Right. But the cancel culture, which a lot of that people, which a lot of what they're feeling, um, does feel very oppressive. I do agree that there is, especially in the, like, I think the LGBT community with Pride, for instance, 10 years ago, when I went to Pride, it very much was me going to support equal, op- equal, mm-hmm. equal representation under the law. Like, I'm a person that doesn't think that government should be involved in marriage. But if government's going to be involved in marriage, it should be, it should be the same for everybody, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And until we as libertarians can convince enough of the culture to remove government from marriage, partners shouldn't be separated from each other in hospitals. Oh, yeah, or, that's, definitely, for, right. that's definitely better than the alternative. Right. Pride now has become a bit of a litmus test to see if you're a heretic or not. And that's where I don't like it. Mm-hmm. It, it, it has gone from uh, a s- supporting individual rights to celebrating leftist power and uh, getting on the boat, getting on the uh, Yeah. Like bend the knee. Mm-hmm. You're going. So it's become almost a religious ceremony. I don't like that direction. Uh, I don't agree with um, communal rights because I'm an individualist. Uh, I do see the point that some groups need to band together to fight for, um, you know, for instance, in the civil rights era, Mm -hmm. black groups had to network together to concentrate their power to fight for the ability to get the same treatment that whites had. Mm -hmm. Um, But as, as a, as a rule, let's protect individual liberty and then we won't have any problems at all. So I do understand the perspective and see the perspective and agree with the perspective that movements can sometimes go from open up individual rights to all to you're with us or against us. And I do feel that pride is getting there. And I think that's something that, uh, like, listen, if we're going to get to a place in 10 years where if I'm not willing to date a trans person, I'm a transphobe go fuck yourself <laughs> like that that's that's you being um that's the english reformation like i do get that i do get that point uh but the idea that straight people are what are you as a straight man unable to do in society with your sexuality that that like you're just not stopped from anything. You're not persecuted for being a straight man. Like there's no, like it, it, especially nothing that would be institutional. Right. And that's the biggest. That's the biggest thing. Right. If it's not institutional, then it's just voluntary action. Right. And so, like the whole cancel culture culture thing. Mm-hmm. Like, while I don't like it, I'm not a huge fan of it. I think it's kind of like hitting below the belt, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's still voluntary. Well, like, I think Me Too had a lot of good things that came out of it, and I think a lot of good discussions came out of Me Too in my personal life with my female friends. Like, do I like that Garrison Keillor lost his entire career for touching the small of a back of a woman? No, that's overboard. Mm -hmm. But should Harvey Weinstein have a position of power? Absolutely not. So there's good and bad in those kind of... how would you you differentiate cancel culture to a boycott? Well, because I don't see the difference. I mean, did, uh, you, I, I personally, you can boycott over nothing just as easily as you can boycott over something that's important. Yeah, I mean, I personally don't participate in boy. I think boycotts, like, I just think it's stupid. Like, you know, I get using your economic power for one thing or another, but I think I. <sighs> I look at the tops of these movements like Media Matter, like David Brock, like Move On, and I think they use their power irresponsibly. Agreed. Um, and that's one thing that I really why I, why the media really triggers me because as a person who's worked in media for my entire career, I understand the responsibility that I have as I sit behind this microphone because there are a lot of there are the 
10,000 people listening to me. And not every one of those people is going to, um, uh, I have a good audience. You guys don't typically just take what I say at verbatim, right? (laughs) Uh, You guys pick, Harry can attest to this. You guys pick me apart, which is what I want. Um, I don't try to do a show that just indoctrinates people into a certain way. I want you to think. I'm not Tommy Lauren. Tommy Lauren is irresponsible with the way that she uses her responsibility, just like David Brock is. And I think that I get angry at people who are knowingly manipulating the masses because the masses are easily manipulative, manipulated. You, you, dear listener, are easily manipulated. You don't realize it, but you are. I am. Harry is. Mm-hmm. Like, we all are, right? <clears throat> so I think that it is... Boycotts can be used for good, but I also think that there are people who just kind of don't think for themselves and just start hurting other people's business. Like the idea that Deborah Messing is organizing lists of Trump donors in Hollywood so she can excommunicate them from Hollywood. Like this is a woman who probably has said Eugene McCarthy was a fascist and is willing to do everything Eugene McCarthy did while denouncing Eugene McCarthy. Like, the the idea that because you donate to Trump, we're going to blast your name out there so you can be harassed by Antifa and other people. You're putting people in danger. You're causing like boycotts over a CEO's donations to Trump ultimately end up not hurting the CEO. They end up hurting the, the people that work at those companies who have a multivariate view of politics. Mm-hmm. Like it's not a monolith. You know, so I ge- just generally think that boycotts are just kind of, uh, I don't know, it, it hurts the people, it hurts the powerless within those companies more than it hurts the powerful. And that's what the, go ahead. I was going to say that the other difference is, is like usually with a business boycott, the business that's allowed to, if actually doing something, you know, immoral or doing something against the public's will, is able to actually walk that back and come back into the favor council calls would know that they're trying to cancel you they're trying to make sure you can't do anything right whether or not you come out apologize say what you want remember kevin hart came out and apologized they still try to cancel it it didn't matter yeah there's no path to redemption for louis ck apparently yeah you know they're yeah they'll never that, be able to feed his family not like that that is the that is the bullshit part of it that there is no restitution it's a lot of cancel culture is about building power it is about amassing power for the people who are in charge of those movements Mm -hmm. and people who parrot this stuff online are participating in building power for people who are not using it responsibly see i don't think they're building power they aren't no well well, they already have power they're not building it so in my opinion and again this is my my opinion uh i think they're wasting it uh i think the more often they do this i think the more often they basically uh cry wolf when there really isn't there uh, the more the public sees it, and the more power they're losing. I don't know who's the girl, the the Gamergate girl that you mentioned, Harry. Uh, Zoe Quinn. Yeah, had you ever heard of her before she tried to cancel people? Um, let's see. Before, technically, you know, she was there at the epicenter of when Gamergate was started to launch. Right. So, how, how many followers on Discord or Twitter does she have on Instagram? She's got a position of power now because she. She played victim until she built a power base. Correct. You're, yeah. you're right. Yeah. My, my, my concern is while that individual did bring a little bit of power to her, mm-hmm. she pulled that power from other people, those, other, other media outlets, NBC, ABC, so right. on, so on, so on. The power that they use inappropriately, which I think we can both say they're using it inappropriately or corruptively, um, is using the power up to where some people will eventually ignore it. Correct. Her followers will one will not. There's low that 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 hardcore list, but fewer and fewer people. The people who are on the fence will get pushed away and pushed mm-hmm. away and pushed away. And all of a sudden, they will become a monolith. They will be by themselves, and they will have very little effect. Right. Correct. Yeah. But, and okay. that's what you which saw also with Zoe Quinn because. Zoe Quinn, Brianna Wu, and all these like they were doing all this at the beginning of Gamergate. It was huge. These massive figures and could really move with all that power to just shutter the gaming industry. Now, nah, not too much. 
they barely make a stink until like so they until they started to jump jump around on this me too thing and then it's kind of backed off into the suicide yeah so uh yeah gamergate I, it's back yeah so <laughs> i never I, I, I think what bothered me about what bothers me is when libertarians support things like the straight pride parade mm. because it's not promoting individualism. I think if you're a libertarian, you want to promote individualism. What the straight pride parade does is it creates identitarianism. And that is fundamentally opposite to everything that libertarians believe. Secondly, we really ought to be about protecting the rights of the smaller minorities as well. Uh, you know, like at this point, what has the LGBT community not gotten that they've asked for? I mean, that, that, that's sort of the thing that I think you have to look back at the other side and go, what are we still fighting about? What are we still fighting for? Like there's, there's not nearly the amount of injustice that like even the black community still suffers uh, tremendous amounts of economic injustice and suffers mightily because of the war on drugs, policing in America. There's a tremendous amount of things in the African-American community that need to be dealt with. Um, but, you know, the pride movement of 10, 20 years ago was about marriage rights. Well, mm -hmm. that's done. Like, it's, yep. you, you, you couldn't have a society more accepting if you, if you really wanted to. Like, what are we arguing about? And so to just like the straight pride thing to me, it's, it's just coded language. It's just veiled. It's just, it, it, it's, it's adding to the fire of, of an, a liberal idea uh, of, all right, let me say it this way. <laughs> America's founding was supposed to be, or, and we have been trying to live up to, the idea that every person was created equally, that every person has an equal start, that every person has the ability to become successful if they want. And it is becoming, it, it is infinitely harder in a society to do that, to live up to those, those libertarian values that this country was founded on, if we're all dividing ourselves into warring camps. And when libertarians participate in building those warring camps, they move society away from libertarianism and more towards factionalism, which is exactly what you don't want, which is when you look at, when you look at um, dysfunctional countries like Iraq, for instance, you have literal, literal tribes make up the government and they can never agree on anything because they're completely dysfunctional. Uh, because they can never see past their, their particular tribe that they're trying to represent. Uh, so I think libertarians have to be beacons of individualism in this time, say that everybody who is uh, breathing is afforded dignity and res respect, and from that all of our policy should flow. Um, and those who have been denied the ability to – those who have been denied dignity ought to be given it, ought to be, you know – lift it up i think uh, like when i see when i see like on the super bowl commercials there were some super bowl commercials that featured no white faces mm -hmm. the intention was not to say white people aren't valuable the intention was to say if you're a chinese girl or a black man look there's somebody in the media that looks like you that's the intention of it it's not intended to erase white people. It's not like, so I think as libertarians start to go down that road, it's going to lead to very bad places. You're, you're moving yourself away from libertarianism, frankly. Uh, and it's, it's going to take you to a dark place. And I just think it's, you know, if you looked at the straight pride parade and thought that you wanted to go rethink it, because I think you're, you're not thinking in, classic libertarian principles through based on individual rights like i just think it's like to me well if your goal is to achieve power block voting is a thing sure so identity politics is became a thing because of that um the left plays identity politics the right plays identity politics uh when you're dealing with the verbal war that is politics mm -hmm. that is a strategy that you can't ignore Sure. I disagree with it completely. I disagree with the authoritarian tendency there. 
but the idea that you can say don't do it and that's going to have any effect is no i get why people do it and i get why people follow the anger of politicians like aoc or donald trump Mm -hmm. they 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 intentionally inflame their sides against other people they they build coalitions based on hate like they're I get why they do it. It's worked spectacularly through human history to build coalitions and power. Mm -hmm. But should you personally participate in it? You should really think about that. And my answer is absolutely no. I completely agree. Yeah. And that's where you got to get back to it. You got to stick to as a, as an individual wanting to do better for the world. And this is for the listeners, for myself included. If your goal is to make the world better, Mm -hmm. the only way to make the world better is to, Treat your neighbor with respect. Treat your coworker with respect. Treat them like they were like you'd have them treat you, and expect the same in return. Yeah, we got um, so. Um, let's see here. I'm trying to pull it up. So going around the internet today, you'll see uh, I posted it. It really got started with Joe Rogan, but a lot of people are posting it. Um. And it basically says, please read. Special request to all you kids returning to school in the next few days. If you see someone who is struggling to make friends or being bullied because he or she doesn't have many friends or because they are shy or not as pretty or not dressed in the most, quote, in clothes, please step up. Say hi or at least smile at them in the hallway. You never know what the person might be facing outside of school. Your kindness might just be a big difference in someone else's life. Repost if you agree. Now, I think that this is catching on. I think Dave Chappelle is catching on because it's someone saying, stop the madness. Mm -hmm. We can laugh. If you don't laugh at what causes you pain, then it has too much power over you. Let's all just look at this as everything everything is open to be made fun of. And if you make fun of it, you can still love that person. Just because you are making fun of, you know, Michael Jackson looking at buttholes, it doesn't mean that you can't have empathy for the victims of Michael Jackson, allegedly. Um, but you look at these sh- the mass shootings, like as we have discovered over the conversations that we've had about mass shootings, the answer is not take away guns. That's just not going to solve any problem and probably make a lot of things worse. The answer is find a man in your life that seems like he's in trouble and reach out to him and be his friend. Mm -hmm. If you see someone who shows warning signs of depression, don't just, man, that seems weird. I hope they turn out, I hope it turns out fine. Like, no, go and talk to that person. Initiate a conversation. Like, the solution is so hard to stop mass shootings, homelessness, abortion, Uh, all these major things that we struggle with, bullying on on the lower levels. The answer is just treat people nicer. I mean, it's, (laughs) it's, it it, it sounds simple, but I think you're right. And when it comes down to it, it's just people are so used to, especially through the color of politics, viewing the other side in a way that there makes them less human. Right. You know, the left does it to the right, the right does it to the left. They make the other side look like they're less human, so that you hate them. Right. When you when they're less than human, then it becomes very easy to justify violence against them. Right. When you look at a little kid who's sleeping in their own shit, and you go, "Well, their parents shouldn't have brought them here," that should be a warning sign that something's wrong with your soul. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a child, right? Like, and I think th- that as we move into this election cycle, we're all going to have to check our guts and just go because I do it every day. I certainly it weighed into divisiveness and I treat people rude and I'm trying to get a laugh out of people by being mean to somebody like I, I'm not some great hero, but I'm, I'm just trying to identify like what's going to actually make things better that you can do. You can't pass gun legislation to stop mass shootings, but you probably know somebody in your family or circle of friends that is showing some serious troubling signs. When Tanner showed up here and was in trouble, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit that none of us really did anything. We didn't really do much to help him. We didn't really intervene. And that is something that I will always regret, that 
he was sitting in my living room. I could tell something was wrong, and we said, man, I hope he turns out okay, which thank goodness he did. That shouldn't have been this. That should have been me going, Tanner, what's going on? Like, is this just weed or what? what? Like, you know, his buddy Kyle, who was on the show, actually did something. And he didn't get through to him the first 50 times he talked to him. But when he finally got through to him, he was there for him. The, the problem is there's a, there's a definite social stigma yeah. in the actual act of reaching out to helping somebody. Again, because it makes it look like you're – I don't, 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 don't want to say the word side with them. But right. you sort of, sort of get the, the stench right. on you know, the quote on your air and air quotes, the stench on you by associating with you. Right. Oh, by associated with them, and that's something you're gonna have to that we all need to get past. That we yeah. all need to say, I don't care what people think of me. This person needs help. Right. All right. Let's start wrapping up. Final thoughts, Harry. Show the show the man how it's done. Um, I just want to reiterate. Um, please don't use charcoal uh, lighter fluid on your charcoal. Uh, get a chimney, um, stack it up, and uh, light your charcoal. Uh, like a man understand that this is a very slow process that you should take some time and relax not to be rushed if you're going to rush all right Travis, final <laughs> you can use the electric grill if you're in a rush um <laughs> you have a grill until you grill with natural gas <sighs> oh, oh natural gas oh you, you want to taste the heat not the meat Anyways, uh, the <laughs> taste the heat, not the meat. Yeah. Go to charcoal. <laughs> taste the smoke. The the thing is, like, what what I did mention, like, a lot of this, these like these massive body blows that happened to cancel culture, and that the Dave Chappelle sh- uh, special came out like at one of the one of the good times for it. Try to there is a lot of different commentaries on YouTube that you can watch of. People talking about what Zoe Quinn has done, has came out and done. Now you could believe Gamergate wholeheartedly what it is, right? Yes, but this guy Alec did try to reach out and talk about how he was suicidal. How someone, someone may just drive into suicide because of what happened. And these people were all friends; they're all a group of people. And then he gets canceled and commits suicide. It's it's a, and it's an, a heart wrenching story. And you watch this guy who was trying to just get a game and reach out and you know. So I will say that that to people like if you are having these thoughts, reach out to somebody. Do not, you know you don't have to go this alone. Reach out, reach out to somebody. There's a, a, tons of different suicide prevention hotlines that you can reach out to somebody. And honestly, if you've got those thoughts, you can walk up to anyone on the street, and most people, if you tell them this, they'll try to they'll help you. Cashier, for God's sake, like yeah, yeah that's the thing that. You know, the, when the LA Times studied mass shooters, there were four distinct traits that they had, and there were like three solutions um like 80 percent of them are massively depressed and like 70 percent of them 60 just had just a life-changing event like the guy in uh dessa had just been fired like there there are serious things happening with men we've talked about it several times on the show around 240 episode 242 talked a lot about it um the answer is to actually start talking to men about their feelings and allowing men to talk about their feelings. Right. I can tell you as a man who is an emotional man, talking to women about my feelings that I am in a relationship with, they typically don't like that. And so if you're a woman listening to the program, how often do you uh, allow your man to be expressive about his feelings without judging him for it or mm-hmm. you know, like uh, it, it just is, uh, it's very difficult i'm not saying it's not difficult to be a woman but it's difficult being a guy too right and there is a a strong movement of girl power in the world today which is good but there also needs to be a strong movement of talking to men and making them uh get them to a place where it's okay to talk about the struggles that you're going through with people you know, you're not weird for thinking and feeling the same thing that literally every guy on his, on the planet Earth for all of time has felt. You know, like there's there there's just a lot of mental health struggles among amongst men today, and if we tackle that, 
then we could make a serious dent in suicides and mass killings and school shootings and bullying and rape and domestic violence. We can do a lot of really good things if we really tackled that one problem. That's something that everybody could be on board for except the fringe feminists and we will marginalize them and tell them to shut up. Like you look at nobody's really in the last couple of years done more for men's mental health than Jordan Peterson. And look at how he has been smeared in the media over and over and over for, for just, why are all your, uh, why are all your, uh, why is your audience all male? I don't know. Cause men are desperate for any sort of thing that attaches meaning. Like what you have to understand is our, our modern monetary theory, our call, our culture is built on your utility in the marketplace. And that robs us of a spiritual place in the world. And so when your work is meaningless, there really is no other meaning for you, especially as we have eroded all of the communities like churches, um, you know, the International Order of Odd Fellows, Lions Clubs, Rotary Clubs, like as those have gone away, as churches have gone away, as like what, what do men really bond around? And, and it's sports. It's why ESPN is a multi-billion dollar company. It's because that's the last place that men really, that's the last connection that they have to each other, it feels like. You know, so unless they're in a community of of people that connect well, like we're libertarians or churches or something like that. So, you know, video games, uh, Harry hates this, but video games can either be an escape or they can be a good community. Uh, but if it is your only community, then that's usually a problem. So, I mean, it's, you, you know, there's just a lot of challenges um, in, in the man, in men's minds right now, and we're not tackling any of it because it's not PC enough. So, you know, you want to stop mass killings, stop male suicide, right. tackle male suicide, yep. because every one of these mass killers want to kill themselves and are going to take a few people with them. Has nothing to do with the gun. Has everything to do with male suicide that is the epidemic in america today and nobody wants to talk about it because they'd rather exploit tragedies for political points yep. yeah because there's tons of studies that has just shown that male suicide has skyrocketed it has jumped it's, it, keep, it, right. it just keeps increasing and it's 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 sad because most people don't want to talk about it they don't want to understand or address the issue the other thing what i will say is if your sp if your spouse wants to talk about feelings and you are not you're not equipped with the tools to talk with your feelings, it's okay to tell you know like hey I'm not equipped to help you with this and go either get a mental health professional or just have that person just have a group of friends. I never understood the magnitude that Liberty and Chill has on people. Uh, the simple fact that this group that we've got that shows up on Fridays and we we've we're this tight-knit group now and it's i just to me and it's always just like whatever i just gonna go there drink beer and i'm gonna eat some food but no we've got a group it's this is our solid group we're all looking out for each other and talking about our, each other's feelings on uh, on these fridays and it's kind of weird how close i've came to this group you know right. so i just started up like whatever well, we're gonna go here talk liberty and drink woo and then we got this tight group so if you if you need something like that start a group like that it's great also allow your spouse to get out of the house to start a group like this without you you guys are your two best friends and it's okay to have other friends it's fine yeah sorry travis final thoughts for the episode uh tiffany sweetheart i love you happy birthday suck up don't you dare <laughs> that's in the heart anything else no, the biggest concern, I want to double down on what Harry said, and I really do feel strong about this. If you want to solve a lot of the violence in the world, a lot of the, especially the gun violence, is you got to solve the idea of violence. Why do people want to commit violence? You got to make sure we all are treating each other like human beings, like they're their own individual person. You got to get out of the block group think, and you got to get mental health down. Cool. And if and for people who are listening, if you need to talk to somebody, somebody is willing to listen. 
if your wife doesn't do it, if your friend doesn't do it, if your neighbor won't do it, somebody will. Find somebody. Don't be ashamed to find somebody. Yeah. The, it's jumping out of the airplane is hard until you jump out of the airplane. Uh, I personally have done it. I've gone from being on the verge of suicide several times to being uh, quite successful, as Travis can attest to being in this luxury uh, open concept apartment. Uh, but, you know, I, all I will say for my final thoughts is just do it. Go to your, go to your health insurance website look up a therapist and book an appointment. If you don't like the therapist, go book a different one. It's like dating until you find somebody you click with. I was fortunate to find my therapist. I clicked, I've gone to three therapists over my, the course of my life. The third one I just really clicked with. I've been with her for four years, five years almost. And it's changed my life immeasurably. And uh, that along with exercise, like, uh, you know, it, Trust me, it's hard being a bigger guy and exercising and going to Orange Theory and having my butt kicked for an hour, but I feel amazing today, and uh, the second this is over, I'm going to fall asleep. Uh, but you just have to do it. Like anything in terms of self-improvement, you just have to do it. Quit making excuses. Quit delaying it. Quit dragging your feet. Just do it. Just do it. Somebody somebody said that once. It was really – somebody should write that down. <laughs> uh, all right. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of We Are Libertarians. We really appreciate you listening. Thank you to our patrons for making this possible, and we will see you next week. Oh, I should stop this. Ah!